Hello and welcome to Ground Truth's first ever Google Hangout on Nigeria. We just had um, the first ever um, peaceful transition of democratic power in Nigeria this week. And we brought on our Middle East correspondents, um, or Middle East correspondent Lauren Bond, Nigeria correspondent Chika Odua. Can you tell me if I'm correcting that, pronouncing that correctly? Um, with the Washington Post deputy digital ed editor of the opinion section, Karen uh, Atia. And then we have um, political military analyst Leslie Warren. Uh, thank you all for joining us. And if anyone is uh, following this from Twitter or watching the live stream, you can tweet us at Ground Truth or use the hashtag Ground Truth Nigeria to ask any questions. And all of these wonderful, brilliant ladies will um, answer your questions. All right, ladies, take it away. Love that this is an all women conversation. So, as Ghazala just said, this week, President good luck Jonathan because he did his re election bid in Nigeria's first ever peaceful democratic transition of power. Chika, you are one of my favorite, if not my favorite, journalists on the ground in Nigeria. So can you just break down the significance for us? Why is this election so important? We say it's peaceful, but let's remember that at least 40 people were killed. But of course, it was largely peaceful. The transition has not yet taken place. That will happen on May 29th. Um, the importance of this election lies in a number of realities. Number one, an ongoing insurgency in the Northeast, which has killed more than 13,000 people and displaced more than one million. I've made a, a few trips to the Northeast of Nigeria to see how the insurgency has destroyed lives. Um, last week, I traveled to the Northeast, and on election day, I was in Chibok. This is the village where Boko Haram kidnapped 270 schoolgirls. Um, coming back to Abuja from Chibok just a few days ago, Boko Haram insurgents shot bullets at my car. I did manage to escape, but I do have first-hand experience with the reality of this insecurity that is plaguing millions of people. Um, I would say number two, the significance is that never before has an opposition party yielded such high level of support in Nigeria. In the past, with the military regimes, the opposition would have been squandered. They would have been suppressed. So this time around, the opposition was allowed to express itself. I'd like to think of this as a sign of Nigeria's maturing democracy. The opposition was able to galvanize a majority of supporters who thought that uh, the president did a poor job in trying to, again, squash the insurgency and just actually just govern the people. They felt that he did a very poor job. And again, we saw more people come out this time than ever before. More than 55 million people collected their voters' card to be able to participate. We've never seen this before. Number three, I would say the significance is that the gap in Nigeria between the rich and the poor is getting wider. But... <laughs> increasing uh, more important politically and economically. We can see this with the number of foreign retail and food companies coming to Nigeria. KFC is here. The ShopRite supermarket is here. McDonald's is looking at coming here. So this middle class, they yield consumer power and they want to be able to express themselves politically. And that's what we saw on March 28th. Awesome. Let's just backtrack real quick for people who don't know a lot about Nigeria. Karen, um, you know, we do know some things. Nigeria recently eclipsed South Africa as the biggest economy in Africa. As Chika mentioned, there's ethics, significant inequality. There's, of course, corruption. There's the Boko Haram, which makes headlines weekly. Um, but can you perhaps paint a better picture of Nigeria for us and exactly what's at stake in this new administration? Sure. You know, um, so especially when I tend to write about Nigeria, I, I try to remind people that Nigeria is... Um, like you just said, is the continent's largest economy. Um, and not just the largest economy, but the largest population. So with a little over 170 million people, and estimates that one in every seven Africans is a Nigerian, um, it's, it has the potential for being a, um, not just a regional powerhouse, but a powerhouse for the entire continent. And when it comes to um, the U.S.-Africa, uh, sorry, U.S.-Nigeria relationship, um, the U.S. is uh, the largest uh, foreign direct investor in Nigeria. So the U.S. government has um, a lot of interest uh, with the success of Nigeria's democracy and with tackling corruption. 
Um, and not just that, but as far as uh, the diaspora as well, there are, especially in the United States and in the uh, United Kingdom and all over the world, um, with large numbers of, of Nigerians abroad, and the whole world literally was watching what was happening this past weekend. So, um, and not just that, but culturally, um, we have uh, obviously Nollywood um, has made headlines. We have a lot of Nigerian writers, you know, Chimamanda Adichie, which is, uh, you know, in the spotlight right now as one of Nigeria's foremost uh, writers and thinkers. You know, I think um, Nigeria's profile has risen internationally. Um, yes, for the negatives that have happened with Boko Haram and with the potential of election violence, but as far as what it's contributing to the world um, econom uh, economically and culturally. So I think it's, it's, uh, this has been a huge, um, a huge watershed moment for, for the world, really. No, definitely. Um, I feel you can't have a conversation about Nigeria by having a conversation about Boko Haram. Nigeria is, of course, so much more uh, than this group. Um, but Leslie, you know, you're one of the best security experts on Africa and military, and I'm interested because how well do you think Buhari is and his administration is in um, how or how well equipped, equipped do you think he is? in fighting Boko Haram because he is a military man and I'm wondering is this a benefit or does it suggest more of the same because as we've seen the Nigerian military has proved a bit ineffective at dealing with the group. Uh, Lauren, as I always say, um, flattery will get you everywhere. <laughs> Thank you very much for your, <laughs> for your flattery. Um, so you bring up a really good point about um, Buhari being a military person and his um, I guess the ability for his administration to be able to more effectively fight Boko Haram. So on one hand, you could argue that he is better equipped to fight Boko Haram because he has a military background. So some of the speculation that I've heard um, over the past few years is if Boko Haram had emerged in the way that it has in the past, um, I would say, two, three years, if that had happened under Obasanjo, who is also a military man, um, the group would not have gained as much uh, momentum as it was under the Good Luck Jonathan administration. Mm. Um, as many people know, Good Luck Jonathan is, is not a military man, has less familiar, familiarity with military affairs. And so one of, the counter, one of the arguments I heard over the past few months is because Jonathan is not a military man, he has less visibility over what the military does um, and mm. what, they, what they tell him they're going to do and what, what are the actual results on the ground. And one of the... Um, it, one of the consequences of that is there have been allegations of um, corruption in the procurement process um, in the Nigerians' arms industry. Um, and you can argue that not being a military person, he might not have as much visibility over what the military is procuring and yeah. what, what are the impacts um, on the ground in terms of the fight, um, in terms of countering Boko Haram. On the, on the flip side, uh, because Buhari is a, a military man, you know, he's, he's retired military, you could argue that that could, that could reinforce the military-centric um, way in which Nigeria has chosen to counter Boko Haram. Um, so as I, as I usually say, it, it's kind of to be determined what, what his approach will actually be, but hopefully he, he and the people around him, he and his advisors will realize that um, this is essentially a political conflict and it doesn't necessarily have a, a military solution. Or just a military solution, I should specify. I mean, and just staying off of that because corruption has, has so much to do with a lot of Nigeria's problems, we hear a lot about the fact that Nigeria is corrupt, but you know, Chika, I'd love to get a sense of what that actually means like on a day-to-day -day level. What does this corruption look like for the typical man on the street? And, and who's to blame? I mean, when Buhari says he's going to fight corruption um, and that corruption attacks our national character and distorts the economy, do you think he's just simply playing lip service? Yeah. You know, there's the phrase that you hear a lot in Nigeria these days, and that is, President Jonathan's administration is the most corrupt in Nigeria's history. Hmm. You hear this in the headlines and newspapers, you see it on Twitter, you hear people saying it on the street. And of course, this administration has been rattled by one scandal after another. 
and you've got ministers and officials making outlandish purchases with public funds, and many mm. of these people never actually get fully prosecuted. So Nigerians are very infuriated by this. However, corruption has a trickle-down effect in Nigeria. It's not only the political elite that's stealing money. Nigeria is a hustler's world. Most <laughs> people here are just trying to make their way. And that often means cutting corners, making under-the-table deals, paying some bribes, performing sexual favors to get a job. So the man that is illegally importing cars into Nigeria from the neighboring country or the merchant that's selling fabric at the marketplace, corruption is trickling down. All these people are trying to cut corners. Um, so I, would like, I like to say that corruption in Nigeria is not only economic, it has become a social paradigm. Yeah. So Buhari, I don't think he's make. I don't think Buhari is paying enough attention to the sh the social corruption that is actually destroying Nigeria. I've interviewed mothers who make sure that their daughters don't get home before 9 p.m. because they want to make sure their daughters are getting enough money from their male clients. So these daughter, the mothers actually sanctioning their daughters to be prostitutes. In parts of northern Nigeria, you've got parents getting their prepubescent daughters married off to men that they barely know simply because the parents cannot afford to actually take care of them anymore. So we're hearing more and more cases of young brides killing their husbands in northern Nigeria. Is this corruption? Perhaps yes. Poverty and angst has driven many Nigerians to do what they wish they didn't have to do. And let's not forget that the political elite, those with power, are exploiting this desperation of the masses. They're making them do what they don't want to do because they need a job, they need a promotion, they need food to eat. So that's what corruption has become in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. How do you go about changing that, do you think? I mean, you're on the ground every day. Do you think the answer lies in more job opportunities? I mean, we spent last year going around the country for two weeks, and it was interesting because people were actually saying, yes, Boko Haram this, Boko Haram that, but the day-to-day -day struggle, the day-to-day -day hustle is what really gets them down. And I'm wondering, you know, with your um, specific perspective of seeing everything day to day uh, go on, what what are the solutions? I really think education. I really do think with education you have access to better jobs and you kind of connect. So with that better job you're in a position to make better decisions because you don't have to do what you don't want to do mm -hmm. for a job or for money. So I definitely think education is the answer in Nigeria. Yeah. So just to broaden this conversation out, um, Chika, I know we always talk a lot about the narratives of stories and the narratives that make the news and sometimes how they're problematic. And I can't help but feel in this conversation right now, we did tend to focus on the challenges. I mean, Nigeria makes the news often, actually, compared to other countries on the continent. But for the reasons we discussed, corruption, a violent insurgency, and I'm wondering for for each of you guys. I mean, what are we missing here? Is there is there too much sensationalism around Nigeria's problems that we need to rectify? I mean, what are mis missing pieces of the puzzle here? Yeah, I'm so glad you asked this question, Lauren. Yes, Nigeria is certainly sensationalized in the news media, and there is a certain slant, a negative, almost sarcastic an apathetic bias that is almost always present in reports I read from Western journalists reporting on Nigeria. The same phrases are repeated over and over again. A woeful nation, the cursed giant of Africa, a den of corruption. And Nigeria has all of this, yes. But isn't the role of journalists like us to push the narrative further instead of repeating the same old news? I like to see more stories about Nigeria's cultural heritage the historic artifacts that are sitting in museums and art houses all over the world which hail from Nigeria. Um, we have cultural festivals, we have so many opportunities for tourism. The land in Nigeria is so vast from the rocky hilltops in the north to the rainforest in the south and then there's the women of this country. Nigerian women are amazing and I staunchly believe that it's the Nigerian women who are keeping this country together. I've met so many women who are challenging the status quo and defying the patriarchy system that is in place in Nigeria. And then there also are the minorities, the minority ethnic groups that rarely get attention. We often hear this phrase in the media, the Muslim North and the Christian South. And that right. phrase is so highly inaccurate. Nigeria, Northern Nigeria has huge pockets of Christian communities. Southern Nigeria, particularly the Southwest, um, they have a huge politically powerful um, Muslim contingency. And of course, Lagos the media capital of Nigeria, the business capital of Nigeria, the most populous city in Nigeria is in the southwest. Yeah. So these are some of the missing stories I think that we don't hear enough in Nigeria.
How about from your perspective in DC? Because you have an interesting vantage point in that you're kind of in the halls of power, at least close to them. I, how do you see the story paradigm and the narrative being told, both in the news and then also in the DC think tank discourse? I mean, what's missing? Sure, definitely. Um, you know, from our point, um, especially with the challenges with Boko Haram, there's a sense of obviously frustration, right? With, with about Jonathan's administration and whether or not um, with the issue of the human rights abuses um, allegations with the military um, there was a sense of frustration with Nigeria and a sense of a country that didn't want to help itself as far as a um, country that was dealing with um, an insurgency that has been raging um, for so long so you know there is a, a a bit of I would have to say my sense is a bit of a relief that uh, that there's been a peaceful um, peaceful election, and that um, Buhari, who um, who has who does also have that image here of um, of, a, of a military man, but frankly, also to a certain extent, and I have seen in, in the media here that angle of an ex dictator wins in Nigeria as well. So again, I mean, there's still a, the vestige of those old narratives dictators and violence and um, just frankly like you know not giving Nigeria credit for um, having a decent election you know for once um, I would say though that as far as um, positive stories um, we did we ran a column um, last week I believe um, you know from the University American University of Nigeria in Yola and Adamawa State and you have their um, Christians and Muslims working side by side to help the almost at this point 400,000 displaced persons in, in one town alone. Um, so you have stories that are there of, of Nigerians banding together, absorbing refugees from the Northeast that I think you know need to be told more. Um, so you know I think there's also a sense in, in Washington again that when it comes to really helping on the, the military front as far as Nigeria. Nigeria's been a difficult partner to work with, but a bit more of a push on how the U.S. could at least help um, avert a humanitarian crisis with the almost two million Nigerians that have been displaced. So, you know, I'm hoping that um, at the very least you can help to raise awareness about, about the internally displaced persons as well as those who've been displaced to Chad and to Cameroon and Niger. Um, mm -hmm. But I think, again, this is, I think you see here there's a sense that this was historic, that this was um, a, a great moment for, for Nigeria, and just people, uh, IDPs that have been made homeless by Boko Haram, lining up in hours, for hours to vote. I mean, for us that we take our own vote for, for granted here in the U.S., it is an amazing, amazing thing. Um, this is a question from Twitter. Uh, I think this question will be directed to uh, Leslie. This is from Hillary Mattis, and she's asking if there's any potential for Buhari to lay out a PDR for former Boko Haram militant. I'm sorry, could you repeat that? There's a lot of interference on the line. Okay. I'm going to, um, if you guys don't mind, I'm going to mute the other panelists for a, a moment while I've um, have you answer this question, Leslie? Okay. Um, yeah, so Hillary Matfus from Twitter is asking if there's potential for Buhari to lay out a DDR program for former Boko Haram militants. What are your thoughts on that? Sure. First of all, hello, Hillary. <laughs> um, second of all, um, I think that's a really great question, and I think it, it speaks to a deeper issue of um, negotiations and amnesties because those have to come before any sort of um, disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration program. And if you look at the, the history of um, the government of Nigeria's relations with Boko Haram, you've seen that there have been um, several failed attempts at um, offering amnesties and trying to negotiate uh, some sort of ceasefire and some sort of peace. And all of these have ultimately fallen through, either due to um, a lack of credibility in the Nigerian government that they would actually see these um, ceasefires and, and amnesties through, um, or because um, Boko Haram itself would actually kill people who were trying to kill moderate voices that were trying to reach out and create a connection with the government so that they could negotiate a way out of this um, impasse, I guess. Um, so I, 
I, I'm not sure I want to speculate on the chances that Boko Haram may be more amenable to um, negotiating with Buhari, but I think that the issue of amnesties and uh, ceasefires and amnesties would need to come before that. I think you're muted. <laughs> Hi. Uh, I hope that answered your question. <laughs> <laughs> If anyone else has any questions and you're watching, please tweet us at Ground Truth. Um, I'm watching the Twitter feed for any other questions. And we also have. Do you have a question? I have a question uh, for the panel, but I mean specifically for Chica, who's on the ground. Uh, Chica, our, our reporting project focused on youth unemployment in Nigeria. And we spoke to so many young Nigerians, college graduates looking for work, entrepreneurs looking. We're hoping to disrupt the system, and I was just wondering, what was the role of youth during this election season? How did they mobilize, if at all? Um, and also, I mean, is it important to note that Buhari is 75 years old? I mean, is that, I mean, I, I'm all for 75-year-olds, but I'm just wondering, in this context of leadership and, I don't know, break it down. Oh, I think Chica's muted. Chica, you need to unmute yourself. Can you hear us? Chica! Oh, is that good? Oh, there you are. There you are. <laughs> okay. yeah. I mean, I don't know. Is that, a, is that a stupid question? You can totally call me out here. I mean, is that is it significant? No, it's definitely significant because it's been an issue. You know, the First Lady has made a lot of fun. She's had fun poking fun of his age. He's 72 years old. She called him brain dead. Um, and she's made so many jokes just cracking on his age, and even when he went to London in February, I believe that was, people speculate that he's going for his health, and so people are saying this guy has cancer, so his age has definitely played a role, but even though he is 72 years old, he has a cult-like following in many parts of northern Nigeria, especially amongst the working class and the lower classes. He's been able to galvanize support across the Southwest. And again, Lagos Southwest. So to have Lagos in your pocket is no small feat. Hmm. The youth played a huge role this election season. The Nigerian Twitterati is mostly comprised of young people, obviously. So I'm, I mean people below the age of 35 when I mean youth. And they yield so much political power because of their social media influence. Politicians are actually paying attention to the youth. You know, the president, he has a series of media chats that he's kind of started because the youth have been demanding to hear him talk to them directly. And also, you had young people serving as officers at the polling stations across the entire country. And these polling officers, they're either present university students or they're recent graduates. So as polling officers, they have a huge responsibility to educate voters and also to make sure that the ballot box doesn't get stolen and also to make sure that there's no voter intimidation on election day. We had young people who were composing music jingles on TV and on the radio to support their party favorites. You had young people writing the painting pieces that were getting published in the Nigerian major daily newspapers and magazines. You had young people writing blogs, and some people have very, very influential blogs here in Nigeria. And this is some of the role that they played, and they definitely mobilized themselves to support either the PDP, the ruling party, or the opposition. And so young people are really trying to play a role in how the government is going to govern them. So he's resonating with young people. I mean, I, I just remember all of these young people we were talking to, everyone's kind of noting this, this lack of sort of an inspirational or aspirational leadership figure. So I'm wondering, like, on the ground level, was he really kind of striking a chord there? Yes, Buhari, certainly yes, especially with the progressive-minded people, certainly. Because the opposition is, is automatically cool. You know, you don't want to be in the status quo, so the youth kind of geared towards the opposition because it wasn't the status quo. Thank you. Do we have any other tweet questions? I'm checking. Haven't got anything yet. Do you guys have any other questions for each other? Karen, I think you need to unmute yourself. We're trying to say something. <laughs> All right. Are you back? Yeah, we're back. Okay, so, yeah, on the question of the youth, um, which is, I think, obviously, with Nigeria's massive youth population, the massive youth polls, um, it'll be really interesting to watch, you know, yes, 
these came out and turned out in, in huge numbers to support either side, but whether or not they will be given any sort of real say or or power or whether or not, you know, um, and, and to a certain extent this is similar with, with President Obama, right, that um, the youth use social media and technology to help um, President Obama, you know, win office and then maybe, you know, several years later there's this sense that they were sort of abandoned, you know. So in similar, uh, in similar strains to even the Arab Spring, you know, where um, in Egypt the youth and social media were seen as like the catalyst of this change. So I think that's one thing we have to kind of look for, whether or not um, some people's voices will be heard in, in the new government and whether or not, you know, some new blood will actually uh, uh, be represented in, in the new government. Leslie, I'm wondering from your vantage point if there are any interesting um, comparative models to mention or look at when you're talking about Nigeria and security challenges there. I mean, they don't happen in a vacuum. So I'm wondering if there are any kind of um, examples or, or past um, experiences on the continent with security challenges or insurgencies like Boko Haram that maybe we're not really talking about but should with a view, view toward, you know, finding more solutions and perspectives? Um, sure, and thanks for that question. I'm going to slightly answer it and then I'm going to flip it. Um, so there are, um, there are similarities with, um, between the security threat that Nigeria is facing with regard to Boko Haram and um, Al-Shabaab in Somalia, um, AQIM et al. in northern Nigeria. These are all localized um, insurgencies or terrorist movements that, have, um, that may have global um, connections but really have um, local grievances. But the way I'm going to flip your question is, uh, what strikes me about Nigeria, um, speaking specifically about security assistance, is something that has struck me about um, other countries that I've traveled to and worked on, in that um, the, the United States has this um, counterterrorism train and equip model that it, it uses to um, to basically to essentially address the threats in these countries abroad, so that they don't uh, metastasize into threats to the United States. Um, the the thing about that sort of model is that it's necessary um, in terms of U.S. interest, but it's not sufficient in terms of broader um, stability within the countries. And so you often see that the, the minimal skills and capabilities that we're um, providing for these militaries don't really address these hybrid threats or address um, transnational, um, transnational um, sorts of security challenges. And so what I noticed in Nigeria, I've also noticed in, let me be careful about who I call out, it's well documented about um, what had happened with U.S. security assistance in Mali prior to the March 2012 coup is that even though the U.S. is providing a um, small unit assistance to these countries for specifically counterterrorism purposes, either the country did not utilize the assistance well um, or it didn't, they, they had political reasons that they weren't necessarily addressing the threat that the U.S. saw in the country, which is perfectly reasonable given state sovereignty. Um, but I think that we need to be very careful about assuming that just because the U.S. is providing counterterrorism training and equip to these countries that it's actually going to result in um, an amelioration of the, the security environment on the ground. What did we leave uncovered here? I have one. Get it, Karen! <laughs> We haven't particularly talked much and didn't get as much coverage, but I found it interesting that we actually did have a female presidential candidate this time. <laughs> and, you know, I, I think um, there was you know, commentary that, yes, this was a victory for democracy um, in Nigeria and, you know, the peaceful, um, the hopefully peaceful transition from an incumbent party to an opposition party. Um, did women actually win out? In this, and also maybe this is a question more so, you know, for Chica. You know, have any of um, not just the presidential candidates, but we also have to remember that there are um, national assemblymen and local government races. Have they articulated any uh, agenda for improving the well-being, either the well-being of women or 
has perhaps the, uh, uh, I, I believe her name, uh, Remy Sonaya, if I'm saying that right, um, has her run perhaps inspired more women to enter into politics in Nigeria, or are we still looking at a very patriar patriarchal political culture there? So maybe this is more a question to yeah. discuss. Thanks, Karen. Yeah, I would say if you ask most Nigerians if they're ready for a female president, they'll say no, just because we're just not. And they don't really know how to articulate why. They'll just say it's just strange. Mm -hmm. And even if you look at traditionally, women have been ousted out of places of power from the local level up into the federal level. This administration, President Johnson, he likes to brag about the fact that he has more females in his cabinet than ever before. And this is true. There are more females in Jonathan's cabinet, but these are not elected positions. These are appointed positions. So would they have been there if it was an election? Probably not, because there's still a sense that even Nigerian women, they see themselves in a certain place, uh, many of them, and they don't understand this um, work for power, typical circles. They feel like you know, they should monitor the home front and let the men kind of leave. You hear this a lot with the majority of women in Nigeria. As far as political support being galvanized, I would say that the first lady, Patience Jonathan, did a huge amount of um, trying to rear up women, especially working class women. That's kind of her base. And she likes to speak in a way, in pidgin English, in the language of the people, very um, slang language. And this is what working class women understand. So I actually give her credit, even though she's quite embarrassing, I mean the first lady, to educate people because the way she talks, she has a huge following, a huge, a huge fan base who feel that they can access her. The female presidential candidate, or the one who tried to come out for presidency, she's still a bit intellectually um, out of reach for men many women in Nigeria. I mean, the fact is most Nigerian women are not really educated as far as beyond secondary school level. And so this female, she's not really do enough to kind of get the grassroots. And this is where the First Lady Patience Jonathan is kind of around, trying to get the grassroots. So I think if we want to see more women in terms of um, buying political positions in Nigeria, we need to see them actually able to articulate what they want. Because if you ask them their, what they want it's actually quite silly sometimes. I heard one lady say she just wants her husband to give her more money to go to the market. Mm -hmm. You know, so they can't really articulate exactly what it is. I mean, the masses. Of course, if you go to those in graduate school, yes, but majority of women are not in graduate school. They're farming. They are sewing clothes as tailors. And they really don't understand what governance means for them. Mm -hmm. Do you guys have any other comments, anything else that we've left out? I'm not seeing any other questions from Twitter at the moment. I have a small interjection. Mm -hmm. So one of the, um, I think one of the most remarkable and uh, potentially uh, not profitable but pr productive developments of um, Buhari's election is that it offers an opportunity for U.S.-Nigeria relations to kind of hit the reset button, yeah. um, just because especially over the, the fallout from the Chibok girls um, kidnapping and um, the back and forth about um, why isn't the U.S. doing more to help Nigeria and issues over um, Leahy vetting for Nigerian security forces, and that's um, the, the law that stipulates that the U.S. Um, does not provide assistance to military units that are implicated in human rights violations. Um, I think that those issues that have become so contentious, especially over the last two years, um, it gives an opportunity for a new administration to come in um, and uh, for the U.S. and Nigeria to uh, talk through these issues and see if they can kind of bridge that impasse. Mm. Yeah, I definitely agree. Um, I think, yeah, off of Leslie's point, there, there is this sense that this is a, a, a fresh, a potentially a fresh start. And um, at least here in, in Washington, just hearing some of the, the conversations, um, that the security relationship does have the potential to, to improve. But again, I mean, back to Leslie's point earlier, it's not going to require only a military 
um, solution to to Boko Haram. But one thing we, we also haven't talked about, which is going to be a major challenge um, coming up, is the fact that um, oil prices and how those shocks are going to present a massive uh, a, a massive um, problem for Nigeria. I mean, basically, Buhari is coming in with uh, potentially half the revenue income from for the government. So um, I think that it's it's going to be really interesting to see how that's going to affect perhaps all the promises um, politically that the Buhari has made. You know, where's the money going to come from for fighting corruption? for fighting Boko Haram, you know, and how is that going to, um, you know, really put a potential strain on the country in the next, um, the next foreseeable future. Um, so I think that's one major, major, major challenge that, um, that I think we need to pay attention to going forward. So Chico, what's the next story? Where do you, where do you see the most need for a spotlight? Where are you kind of turning your gears towards? I'm wondering about amnesty for Boko Haram. It's a conversation that people have here. You have people who want to leave the insurgency, but they know if they leave the encampment, they're going to get arrested. But a lot of these Boko Haram insurgents, they're tired, they're worn out, they want to come back to the civilian population to join their families. What happens to them? I'm not advocating anything, but it's just a question to throw out there. Also, you have the vigilantes who are fighting Boko Haram, and I know many of them, um, and I've actually befriended many of them, and I think we need to look at how much power they're getting, because these people were equipped by the state to fight Boko Haram, but some of them are taking the power way too far, they become very heavy-handed in trying to get uh, Boko Haram suspected individuals, women, female suicide bombers, they become quite heavy-handed, and some of them are actually looking to run for local political position. So I'd like to look at the vigilantes who are fighting Boko Haram. Where will they be tomorrow? Do we have another insurgency on our hands? Mm -hmm. And also number two, amnesty for Boko Haram, because the Niger Delta militants, they have their amnesty. So some people are saying, well, why can't Boko Haram have their amnesty? So these are issues that I think we'll continue right. asking and talking about. And to hope that the amnesty agreement for the Niger Delta militants is expiring this year, so that's also another security, serious security challenge from the South that the new, uh, the new administration will have to deal with. That's actually a question I was going to ask Chica. Um, what would you speculate are the, I guess the regional implications, regional me meaning within Nigeria, what are the regional implications of the Bahari wind? Do you expect unrest in the Delta? Yes, and actually on Sunday, the Niger Delta militants, who you and I interviewed, Lauren, they're having a meeting on Sunday to discuss what they need to do. So they're very angry. Um, they feel like the presidency has been ripped away from them. They feel it's, it's still their turn, meaning the South. And so they're having a meeting on Sunday to discuss what they need to do. Um, I interviewed a few just a few weeks ago, and they're saying that if they have to go back to the creeks, the fight, they're going to do that. So definitely we want to see what's going to happen with that. But perhaps they want to listen to the president because he's trying to kind of quell down any type of feelings of we've lost this. Just this morning, some PDP officials are saying that they want to contest Buhari's win. They want to actually challenge it in court. President Jonathan said, no, there's no need to do that. So he's really trying to kind of maintain the peace and trying to just move things forward to have a peaceful transition. So we should give him props for doing that. Um, I just want to interject here with a comment from Twitter from Hillary Mathis again. <laughs> Our Hi, Hillary. <laughs> Hillary. <laughs> I have other viewers, but I guess Hillary has a lot of questions. Um, <laughs> she's is, a researcher, <laughs> so yeah. This isn't a specific question, but she kind of wants to turn the discussion toward um, IDPs and voting in Nigeria, internally displaced people. And um, So if anyone wants to speak on that, go ahead. Do you guys have any thoughts on on IDPs? Actually, I don't know what the technological limitations of this this medium are, but you should actually ask Hillary about that because she was in um, she interviewed a few IDPs when she was in Nigeria a few weeks ago. I know Hillary. I told her she can she can actually join in on this video chat. Um, we have join in on here, but I'll I'll um, contact her directly and see if she can help help her get on this. But she's been tweeting. Maybe she can't. Maybe she's. 
regional office. Um, but yeah. Okay. So that <laughs> Sorry. In the meantime, um, another question I would like to ask. Um, we'll return to the IDP issue um, if we can track Hillary down. Um, another issue I would like to ask is there's this. Um, view that Boko Haram was never seriously addressed by the, the Jonathan administration because it was in the north, um, because the north is already marginalized, because um, it doesn't have resources like the Delta does, and so that's why there was this, you know, these amnesty arrangements in the Delta, but not really, um, there was no real effort on the part of the government to, to make make good on those sorts of promises in the north. Would any of you expect that this might change under the Bukhari administration, either out of necessity or due to his identity as a northerner? Sure, I would say definitely yes. Um, the president, he's not from the north, and the first lady was very open about not being from the north. She made a lot of snide comments about her being a southerner, and it took 10 days, remember, for the president to even admit that the Chippewa girls had been kidnapped. So there is a lack of connection with the people in the North, number one, because of ethnicity, number two, because of religion. But we forget that many of the people who've been killed in the North are actually Christians, and those Christian minorities in the North, they felt that the president kind of betrayed them. Look at Chibok, for example. The Chibok people voted in uh, Good Luck 2011. They voted for him, they galvanized in mass, but now most Shibok people voted for Buhari because they felt betrayed. So there is a sense that, you know, the ethnic loyalties in Nigeria, they, it's like racism in America. Here it's ethnic tribalism that kind of preempts anything. Um, what was your second question about, okay, Buhari? Yes, I would say Buhari would definitely tackle it further because of his ethnic identity and because the religious background, and because of his military background, certainly, I, I expect to see much more changes in tackling Boko Haram and Buhari. Did we lose someone? I think, um... <laughs> <laughs> did someone jump, did the moderator jump ship? <laughs> <laughs> And it'll be extremely interesting to see, um, even just regionally, you know, how Buhari is going to manage Nigeria's role with uh, Chad and Cameroon and Niger as far as the multinational um, offensive against Boko Haram. And, and perhaps Leslie could speak more to this, but leading up to um, the vote, there was a lot of bickering and back and forth and uh, sort of bad blood about who, which national army was taking the credit for uh, for actually some, you know, victories and, and some um, advances against Boko Haram and some successes in driving them out. Um, so that will be a very uh, interesting dynamic to, to see going forward because now, you know, Boko Haram, we talk about it, Boko Haram in Nigeria, in Nigeria, it is now a massive regional threat. And Boko Haram did have the capability to launch attacks in the neighboring countries. Um, I guess there's, you know, perhaps uh, debate about whether you know Boko Haram has been weakened and whether that will be sustained going forward. But um, you know, again, Nigeria will Nigeria be able to manage its its role in in this multinational uh, mm -hmm. multinational offensive um, without mm -hmm. you know angering everybody else <laughs> around around them. So. I think yeah. an important point to um, acknowledge when you're talking about this regional. Um, this regional offensive is Chad and Niger in particular, specifically Chad, these countries see themselves as being encircled by violent extremist organizations. And so you could argue that they're, they were probably peeved by the fact that Boko Haram had just been festering in Nigeria and had been, um, their members had been taking sanctuary um, in Cameroon, in Niger. Um, and I think they might be more, they might be, happy that there's a change in administration that may take this threat more seriously. And so with, with the election of um, Gen General Buhari, General Retired Buhari, <laughs> um, with the election of uh, President-elect Buhari, you might see these countries, um, you might see a reduction in bad press about the way that the countries are interacting in northern Nigeria and in the region, and you might see more press about how um, cooperation is actually improving and increasing. That's just my speculation, though. And then just to zoom out before we end the call, because I'm getting some tweets right now. Um, 
just asking for general recommendations on whether they be experts to follow or books to read or movies to watch. You know, a lot of people don't know that much about Nigeria. Um, what they know of it is perhaps simply just Boko Haram in this very kind of narrow um, perspective. But uh, do any of you, I mean, for just people who are just joining in the conversation, don't know much about Nigeria, we kind of got wonky and threw the weeds here, which is great. But what are some general recommendations you have for someone who wants to know more about the country? I would recommend two websites and a book. The book is This House Has Fallen by oh. Carl Mayer. This House Has Fallen by Carl Mayer. I think it's just the best book to read for anyone trying to get a peek into Nigeria. And as far as the websites, Africa in Transition, the blog by the U.S. Ambassador John Campbell, amazing. He speaks very, very, um, his, his analysis is very easy to follow and he actually gives context, which is very hard to find in Nigeria. So that's African Transition, the blog run by U.S. Ambassador John Campbell. And number two, thecable.com. Is it .com? If you just Google the cable, it's a Nigerian media outlet. They offer the best political analysis, I, in my opinion, for Nigeria. It's a very new outlet, kind of trendy, I, and I would recommend it definitely. How about fiction writers? Tika, I know you have a whole, you introduced me to tons of incredible writers. Um, and just to zoom out and not look at, at Nigeria through these security lenses, I mean, what what literature would you recommend? Leslie, can well, you Well, this is my bookshelf behind me, so. <laughs> I know. You've introduced me to so many people. You've introduced me to Lola. You've introduced me to a lot of great literature. And I think it's a really important, I mean, Yes, this is a foreign policy conversation, um, but I think it's a really cool lens in which one can glean insight. So I, you know, I think it would be great if you could just throw out some book recommendations. Helen Habila, I think he's underrated, and a lot of Westerners don't know about him. But he writes a lot about Nigeria's political space and a lot about the prison, um, the prison nightmare that Nigeria is. So Helen Habila, I would def definitely recommend him. Um, Teju Coles is also good. He's a good background. We already know Chimamanda, but definitely, I would say Helen Hambila as far as something, someone oh. unusual, someone different. Awesome. Thank you. Hi, and welcome Hillary Mathis from Twitter. Um, Hillary, you can add more. Twitter. 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 I am. I am just from the Twitter uh, sphere. <laughs> And can uh, I just quickly ask Hillary, Hillary, if you can please talk about the story you did about oil in Lake Chad and how that relates to the Boko Haram insurgency. It was brilliant. A lot of people don't know about it. Oh, thank you. Um, so that was published with uh, Quartz, if anyone wants to dig through the archives for that. Um, but in the 1970s, Nigeria and Chad actually sort of fought these skirmishes over um, land in the Lake Chad Basin, which is currently a boat stronghold. And there's a lot of speculation as to whether or not there are significant petroleum reserves in the Lake Chad Basin. Um, we all know that the instability in Chad prevented exploration of their oil reserves even just in the country south uh, until the early 2000s and the, the famed, the infamous uh, Chad Cameroonian pipeline project falling apart. Um, so I think that there might be some sort of international interest in exploring the petroleum reserves in uh, Chad, in the Lake Chad Basin, but for now it's just sort of uh, in the realm of conspiracy theorists, uh, which was interesting and, and great to hear about in uh, Kano when I was visiting there. Hillary, can you talk to us a little bit about the IDP situation in Nigeria? Right. For a lot of people, they don't know that there are IDPs in Nigeria. Why are people being displaced? Can you just kind of break it down um, right. from the root? Well, thank you, first of all, so much for kind of letting me crash your awesome party. Um, and I was so excited for this open. today. Um, Ground Truth is very open source. We're open to all, and we, we know that <laughs> our audience is, I mean, not our, necessarily our correspondents know everything. Our audience has a lot to add to. So thank you so much. For Anytime. Um, well, when I was in Nigeria, even just briefly, I had the chance to speak with uh, Dr. Jabrin Ibrahim of uh, the Center for Democracy and Development, and he recently <laughs> finished a World Bank project on um, IDPs in the country's northeast, and their estimates were around two to three million displaced people from Boko Haram alone 
in addition to an already estimated 1 million displaced people from floods and farmer herder violence. So right now, Nigeria is kind of sitting on a, a, a brewing social crisis with roughly 4 million displaced people and no real government agency with the funding, the mandate, and the ability uh, to care for all of these people. So thus far, it's been Nigeria's emergency uh, institution, government agency, that's been providing the bulk of the care NAMA. But even so, according to their mandate, they should only be providing care for a month or so. Uh, so there's a lot of institutional uncertainty, a lot of weakness, and the lives of 4 million people, and that number is rapidly rising, sort of hang in the balance. Um, and it's also interesting in the context of the election, I think a lot of people are confident and optimistic in General Buhari's ability to sort of put down the insurgency, but the President's Victims Support Fund for Victims of Boko Haram, it was this big to do with a fundraiser and 80 billion Naira were pledged, 15 billion actually donated. There's a lot of fear now uh, within philanthropic communities that the remainder of those pledged Naira will not be donated because it's no longer politically expedient to contribute to uh, now ousted uh, President Goodluck Jonathan's uh, efforts to help victims of Boko Haram. So I think that's a, a story that could use some more attention. And if you'd like to learn more, please look at my foreign policy <laughs> piece, which came out today. Yeah. Oh, awesome. I missed that in the newsletter. Okay, cool. I, it came out two hours after you guys sent it out, so next week. Great. Um, sorry, I wish I could stay. I guess I'm watching now. <laughs> for Hillary, then I wish I could stay for the rest of this, but um, I do have to run. Well, but this has been fabulous. Thank you so much for joining us, Karen. All of you have... Hi, Karen! Hi, Karen! Good to see you again. Yeah! Hi. Bye. Bye. Um, if anyone is just joining us, this broadcast will be recorded, is automatically recorded to YouTube, so you can rewind and see what you missed. And um, we'll be doing these more often on other uh, stories that we we're focusing on. But we can continue this discussion. I don't know what your uh, time, your schedules are, uh, Leslie, Lauren, and Chica, and Hillary. Um, but I had kind of planned for this to not go more than an hour and a half. Um, but if you hey, one more question. I have yeah. a question for Leslie. Mm -hmm. um, not to go too much in the weeds, but uh, you know, Chica mentioned the Niger Delta militants and the amnesty program and the amnesty deal that's actually set to expire. And, you know, I'm wondering when we talk about Boko Haram and other insurgency, why we don't perhaps make a link between the two? So, I mean, I, the, I know the grievances are different. I know that they're born of different environments. But I'm wondering, is that, are, are we missing something by not making that link? Is there anything to be gleaned or learned from seeing how the government has dealt with the Niger Delta insurgency and the militancy um, in the South, and then how it's dealing with Boko Haram? So in terms of an operational link, um, I, I have not identified that there is any, but in terms of a um, you know center versus periphery link, um, in, in terms of having grievances against uh, of these peripheries against the state, I think that there are definitely commonalities there. And I think that at the end of the day, even though these are conflicts that manif these are grievances that manifest themselves in a military fashion, the underlying grievances are political. And so I think that there's there's definitely a lesson in both the case of um, the Niger Delta militants and with Boko Haram that um, this is to um, attempt to address these grievances in order to avoid them popping up in in these places again and in in other parts of the country. And I think that there's um, some people hate when I use this phrase, but there there's a there there in terms of the way that the um, the administration, the current administration, used amnesties and um, negotiated its way to um, some sort of peace settlement in the Delta, and the the way that they have not been able to do that. Um, because at the end of the day, this conflict in the Delta was not resolved militarily. It was negotiated out. Chica, do you see any links? I mean, you've reported on both really well, and you've gotten to know um, people close to the Boko Haram, if not in the Boko Haram, and also 
uh, former uh, militants in the Niger Delta. We spent a lot of time with them and reported on them. I'm wondering, do you see any, not operational, militaristic links, but do you see just any sort of big sort of societal, big picture connections between the two? Definitely. Definitely. Just like Leslie mentioned, with the Niger Delta, remember, Nigeria found the oil was discovered just before Nigeria got independent from UK in 1960. I believe it was 1957 where commercial quantity of oil was actually discovered in Nigeria. So since then, there have been grievances in the Niger Delta. It's been bubbling. This is not, it didn't just burst out in 2000. It was, it's been going on since 1960s. Same thing with the Northeast. There have been grievances against the government in the Northeast since the amalgamation of Nigeria in 1914. A lot of people in the North feel like they've just been marginalized. They feel a threat from the Western world. You'll hear a lot of older and even younger people in northern Nigeria saying that the Westerners are trying to suppress our culture. They're trying to kind of infiltrate us with their religion, their Christianity. So again, these are issues that have been kind of fueling underground for decades. So that's the link that I definitely see. Just as far as operational, yes, it was actually negotiated at the end of the Niger Delta struggle. And perhaps it's gone too far for negotiations and amnesty for Boko Haram because they've killed so many. Um, the Niger Delta military, the deaths never actually mounted to this much. Um, so I would say that much as far as the familiarity. But there are differences, again, with the deaths and also the international links that Boko Haram is making abroad. Um, Niger Delta didn't do that in the, Niger Delta, in the creeks, whereas Boko Haram, they're actually talking to other Salafist jihadist groups across the world. Is it is it too simplistic to examine uh, the inequities and inequality in Nigeria as being also sort of this other overarching link between the two? I mean, I, obviously that's simplistic, but I'm I'm wondering how much of a role um, the institutionalized inequity in Nigeria plays in both of these these dynamics. It's definitely there. You have um, the elite in the north. If you talk to northern Nigerians, they're very upset about their northern politicians. They say that the northern politicians have neglected them. They've keeping them. They've kept them at the levels where they have to beg. Every morning, you have poor people in northern Nigeria going to the richest man in the village or the town to just beg for money. And this is not only cultural, but they feel this is Islamic. And there's a phrase you'll hear a lot in Nigeria. They say, look at the five fingers. None of the fingers are actually the same size. If Allah wants me at this level, I have to be at this level. If my role is to beg in life, my role is to beg in life. So some people have that attitude where they're always going to be suppressed, but they expect their leaders, especially the Muslim ones from the north, to kind of take care of them. And they feel that they've forgotten to do that, the northern leaders. So that's where that anger comes from, they've neglected them. They're just in Abuja and the mansions and they've forgotten us in our villages. Yeah. And just sort of building off of that, so I'm actually a, a researcher, uh, I'm not just of Twitter, uh, I'm a researcher at the Nigeria <laughs> Violence Project at uh, Johns Hopkins SICE and we put together a database of every incident of lethal social violence in Nigeria since the transition of democracy. Um, so it's a Pretty big undertaking, but if you look at Boko Haram's pattern of attacks, in the beginning it was targeted towards local imams and local politicians. It did not originate as an internationalized Salafist jihadi group. In fact, in the beginning it was more of a dissident sect that was primarily focused on providing social services to residents that were underserved by their government, uh, both federal government and local officials. And their violence was typically aimed at robbing banks uh, in order to provide themselves with the capital to provide services. Uh, and the assassination of imams and clerics uh, and local politicians who were critical of their interpretation. It was really only after the federal government's major initiative against Boko Haram in 2009, in which 700 people were killed, and there were some gross human rights violations that have been very well documented by Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch that we've seen this escalation into national level targets. And then it was only after Chad's incursion into Nigeria to combat against Boko Haram that we saw even a regionalization of the conflict. Um, so at its core, Boko Haram began as a very much a Nigerian phenomenon. We have another um, 
audience member joining us. We have is it your research analyst, right, Kwame? Yes, I. Um, Would you like to support yourself and ask any questions? Hi, Kwame. Hello. Hi, Kwame. It's nice to have a man in the mix. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> it's good to have a man in the mix. Oh. <laughs> well, I, I just happened across this on Twitter, so I, I look forward to um, nice. listening cool. to the conversation. Do you have any comments or questions so far? No, I don't. Okay. Just wanted to join and listen. Okay. Yeah. Can you blame him? Look at this panel. We're <laughs> magnificent. <laughs> yeah, this panel is awesome. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Absolutely. Uh, anyone else have anything else to add? Um, I'd like to pick back up on the um, the fiction nonfiction question. Okay. Um, so I think Chica did a great job of um, highlighting some of the um, some of the great sources for information on Nigeria um, but this is this is not so much self-promotion it's really just sharing information so my blog Leslie on Africa if you just google that um, I did a roundup um, last week I think prior to the elections on um, relevant analyses on the elections and I know that um, the elections are over or the sorry the presidential elections are over and it's less relevant although the analyses themselves are really good. Um, I highlighted things by Hillary, by Chika, by um, several different people, both in Nigeria and in the diaspora and in the US, et cetera. Um, but even if you just look at the names of the people who I mentioned, following their analyses, both um, in, in their publications and also on Twitter, is really helpful because those are my go-to people um, on anything Nigeria. Um, in general, I've found anything by the International Crisis Group, if you're looking for in-depth historical context, to be wonderful. And they, particularly with regards to the Sahel, not just Nigeria, but the context, um, Niger, Poland, another weak link in the Sahel, question mark, is a really great ICG piece that contextualizes a lot of these regional conflicts. So any Nollywood films we should be watching? I mean, I, I feel like people don't really even know about Nollywood. They know about Bollywood, which, of course, is playing off of that. But but it's a really, really robust industry. Chica, what movie should we be watching? Um, I have to admit that since I've moved to Nigeria, I haven't watched as much because I'm already in Nigeria. I feel like I'm surrounded by Nigerian movies. So <laughs> I watched most of them when I was in the U.S. <laughs> Because it was just that long, long game. But I think um, I like the old classics. I have to go with the old classics, like Blood Sisters. The new ones are okay, but I, I had to hail my classic Nigerian movies. Blood Sisters is a good start. Genevieve Naji is a great actress to look up to. And she's actually getting into Hollywood as well. So a lot of movies in Nigeria are actually merging with Hollywood actors. So that's really exciting as well. Oh, wow. Cool. Who else watches Nollywood? I've, I've never seen, I'm, I'm from Bollywood background. What, I want to know more about Nollywood. Anyone else watch and have any recommendations? My dad scarred me as a kid, so I haven't watched them in a long time. He would buy like 10 movies a week. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, there's a whole closet of Nollywood <laughs> movies in my parents' house. Some people have skeletons in their closet. You have Nollywood in your closet. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, in terms of music, if we're going cultural route, um, I think everyone should listen to P Squared Chop My Money um, ah. because it's just. Was uh, there some controversy about P Squared recently ish? Maybe not. Didn't they Instagram themselves in this really lush, kind of extravagant palace, and people were like, whoa, P Squared? No. I, I have no idea, <laughs> I that one. Um, but I did have a great bonding experience while driving from Kano to Jigawa State, um, where the guy was like putting on music and he was like, do you know this one? And he put on P Squared, Chop My Money, and we're driving just through you know, rural northern Nigeria, and it's like, she chopped my money, and it was a really great unifying moment. Um, <laughs> so everyone should yeah. listen to that song. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Did you all talk about the um, 
I guess it was was it an election commissioner who died in kind of mm. um, no. house burned down his family. Yes, yeah. There was a PDP. Someone actually was in Benway. Is it the one you talked oh, about? Oh, was in Benway. Okay. The one I saw was that some thugs burned his house down. This was a PDP official in Benway. Um, so again, there were some minor pockets of violence on the election day. So. Mm. But oh, nothing as monstrous as it was before. Okay. Okay. I actually have to head out. Thank you so much for letting me crash for a little while. This was wonderful, and I'll see you Tuesday, Leslie. <laughs> yeah, see you Tuesday. <laughs> Thank you, Bye, guys. We love, right, we love Thank the other conversation. All right, um, I think we should wrap this up. Thank you again to all of our panelists. We had Karen Atia from Washington Post um, drop out a little bit earlier. She contributed a lot of great insights. And um, thank you again to Hillary Matfis and Kwame Ping Pong for joining, and um, Leslie Warner, um, from, uh, who's a political military analyst, and Chief Arduet, um, our correspondent on the ground in Nigeria, and Lauren Braun, who's reported from Nigeria, our Middle East correspondent. Thank you so much, you guys. This was a fantastic discussion. I know next to nothing about Nigeria, and I learned a lot. And I'll definitely be going back and reviewing um, the recorded version of this talk. And I'll send you guys the link, and I'll tweet it out as well for anyone else watching. And also, what's up? We can tweet out the book and music recommendations. And For sure, I'm planning on looking those up and, and sending out um, tweets uh, to anyone else following along. So hopefully next time we will have um, a bigger audience for you know future discussions. But this was a great first Ground Truth um, Google Hangout. You guys made it wonderful. Thank you so much. Great, and thanks for having us on, and thanks for all of your comments. I learned a lot as well. Awesome. Anyone else? Right. All right, signing off. Thank you. All right, bye. Signing off. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye.